our elderly live with family members or relatives. Right, so roughly about 60 some percent live with their family members or relatives, and another about 10 percent live with other people. There's about 20 some percent who live alone. What's fascinating about this data is this is opposite from the norm of the Canadian elderly population. What we know in terms of the Canadian elderly population is most of them live alone. This is the opposite for the Filipino community in which we live together. What's also quite different is a lot of the Canadian elderly population live in retirement homes. In our study, only two out of 250 live in retirement homes. A very, very small population. So you might ask, why is this so? So this is where our interviews are really, really helpful. Our interviews indicate that Filipinos have to pull resources together in order to make ends meet here in Canada. So we live together, not just because we love each other, we enjoy each other's company, and those are all true, for the most part, but we need, this is a good financial arrangement. It makes sense economically. Right? So that's one. The other reason is Filipinos, particularly the elderly, do not have the kind of private capital that many Canadians have. And by private capital, I mean private pension plans, savings, investments. So without those extra money that the government, or that, that, that are not provided by the government, that a lot of the Filipino elderly are actually not doing well financially. So they primarily, again, rely on the government for their income. Precisely because they don't have those extra resources and private capital like, quote, most Canadians. Two main expenditures, and I'm sure many of you can acknowledge this, housing and food. Housing and food. Again, keep in mind, low income cutoff. If you spend more than 20% of your income on basic needs, you're economically vulnerable. However, our data indicate that our Filipino elderly actually spend most of their money in housing and food. Again, we have to take care of basic needs. And what we know from our data, let me just make sure I can double check this. Seventy-two percent of our participants spend about a thousand dollars or less in terms of housing. So let me break that down even more. Thirty-four percent spent five hundred dollars or less. Another thirty-eight percent spent about five hundred to one thousand each month. And when it comes to food. Most of our participants spend at least, or at the most, $600. Now you're thinking, wow, that's really cheap for GTA, right? Because when we think about sort of regular housing for a one-bedroom or two-bedroom apartment, it's much more than that. And when we think about food consumption, I didn't know, for many Filipinos, I mean, we want to eat, and we want to eat well and we want to have some parties. Spending about $600 a month is fairly reasonable. What we're not realizing in this dynamic is we live in a collective, in a sense that since most of us live together, our share of housing and food costs is only a part of what we're putting in. Right? So we have to understand the Filipino living arrangement in order to make sense of this seemingly reasonably priced housing and food costs. So that's one. The second factor that we have to consider then is, well, if our housing cost is only about 1000 each month, it raises the question, what kind of dwelling 
and what kind of neighborhood then will that afford us? And what we're seeing in our study is even though a lot of our participants live in houses or in apartments, they're usually in postal codes that are actually in somewhat average or less than average neighborhoods. Right? So, so people are living together in houses and in apartments, but from our interviews, we're seeing that many of the apartments that people are renting are dilapidated. And sometimes the superintendent is not very quick in maintaining those repairs. And in some houses, they're in neighborhoods that some might be considered dangerous or at risk. Or in some cases, they live really far away with very limited transportation and access to social services. But that's where the relatively cheaper housing is. So these are some of the dynamics that we have to unpack because this, the numbers alone are not going to say these sorts of dynamics through the interviews and sort of the co um, correlating other sorts of data, we're starting to get a better picture of what the living and housing situation is for Filipino elderly. During our interviews is, um, since now you're retired, do you want to stay here or do you want to go back to the Philippines? <coughs> what do you think their response is? Stay. You're right, stay here. That's really the overwhelming response of our participants. Why? <laughs> Especially for elderly who need health care and support, it's better here than in the Philippines. And your family's all here. So the idea that Filipinos are going back to the Philippines to retire is actually not true for the Filipino Canadian population. Most stay here. Right? So that's something that we have to understand. So if most Filipino elderly are staying here, then we need to create resources and establishments to properly support your elderly years. So we need to create those kinds of supports. Filipinos are good at finding resources, which is great. And thank goodness FCT has a great wellness program and a medical clinic program that could be utilized. But that's only available if you're accessible to downtown Toronto. What if you live in Brampton or Milton or in areas with a lesser concentration of Filipinos? It's much more difficult. Right? 